Hello guys. How are you doing? Just starting up. <clears throat> Hello. We still have people coming in and I am going to start sharing my screen momentarily. Give me a second, opening up this camera as well. You can see me, hi. Let's see who's here. Six people, John, Justin, Kevin, Chris, and Sandeep, five people. And now I will share my desktop. So that is uh, just about to start. I am starting up Zoom conference on the on this machine where I am going to share my <coughs> notepad. And that is what I'm going to begin doing, like this, sharing my screen. And you should see my OneNote. And off we go. That's, that's how we are ready. I think we are getting ready to begin. We have how many people? One, two, three, four, five. Still five people. So I guess I will proceed uh, without any waiting further. I will proceed discussing today and uh, let me mount my microphone, make sure that <coughs> you can hear me properly. I think that uh, check I will do and then I will proceed. Today we will discuss containerization. We'll discuss some of the core concepts uh, behind it and uh, do some exercises, interactive, hands-on. So you should also be able to participate in those exercises. They will uh, uh, begin from core concepts of containerization towards building uh, something useful. So you will see those exercises as we as we develop. This uh, segment on Docker is fairly new. Uh, in in that uh, we decided to not cover the software as a service part. Right? If you if you remember, we decided to ignore this, skip it. So that's what we did. But instead, what I will do today is cover new ground that we have uh, covered only uh, a little bit in the past. Uh, not, with your, not with your group, by the way. Only a little bit with another group in the third segment. So I am basically making a change in the program that will include Docker as a technology, as a core technology. And we will include that right here in the cloud technology segment. Because it is actually, think about it, think about it as a core technology itself. Containerization is as core to cloud as anything else. In fact, it is more so. So that is the reason why uh, replacing software as a service, which tends to be trivial in its uh, nature. Most of us are smart enough to already know. And so we will discuss this thing called Docker as a open source product. Uh, open source product, it is the open source version that we will focus on. There are some commercial enterprise versions also available, as you can see in the Docker website, they advertise these days. There is a commercial enterprise version of Docker. Let's go pinpoint what I'm talking about is this thing. In Docker, there is a product which is an enterprise product, so people can actually buy it if you like, like this version. Enterprise edition, that that thing is a commercial product that Docker now sells. But we will stay focused on the core product, which is open source. And that is the community edition of Docker. That is what we will use. That is what is already loaded in our uh, workstation also. So the cloud workstation that you have, it has Docker pre-installed. You should be able to participate along with me as I begin doing some simple exercises. And we'll build that discussion over time in terms of uh, getting things done as we would like to in the context of using container as a technology. So having discussed this briefly, and at least set an outline, what I would recommend that you go read along alongside as I, as I operate today is to go look at the Docker documentation. That's the best place to really learn about something is to go read the documentation that comes along with a product. 
So this website actually pertains to Docker documentation. The link is docs.docker.com. I will grab a link for you and I'll paste it in Slack chat if you need, but I think you got the link. It is right here, docs.docker.com. That's the website I will begin using and I will begin describing some of the core fundamental concepts behind this, uh, this uh, product. This product is also available on, on, on GitHub. As you can probably see, there is this thing called, uh, uh, let me see if I can go there. In GitHub, you should be able to find a new tab, uh, github.com slash docker. And so that, that location has the source code for Docker. So if you look at this website, somewhere down below, you will find Docker source code. Maybe not readily, so we have to go one more deeper instead Docker, and then you will find it. So this is, hmm, apparently they changed something here. Yeah, so it is not going to the right location where I expect it to go, but don't worry. Uh, let's stay. Uh, begin discussion. So begin the core idea about what this thing does for us, how it is relevant, how it is useful, how it is different from what we already know, which is virtualization, and that deserves uh, some bit of uh, some bit of talk. So this product basically is an implementation of containerization technology. Containerization, and as we started discussing the last time, little bit we did not go deeper, but one of the core aspects of it was this layered file system, layered file system, which is basically you know, allowing us to create layers in the file system, pretty much like that. In a classic traditional file system that you may know of or heard of or used is in Windows land, there is this file system called NTFS. In Unix, uh, you have a variety of file systems, uh, like you know, uh, 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 same is true with Linux, you have ext3, ext4 file system, uh, 3 and 4, and you know, riser file system, and a variety of file systems are already available that people use. And then, you know, in every operating system that you can think of, there is usually a file system that the machine, the operating system, expects where it will store stuff, store files, store folders, and create that graphic, that hierarchical, hierarchical structure beginning from the root location and down there you will have folders and then subfolders and then files underneath like that. That's the structure that we know of already. That's what this file system is. However, the subtle difference between a layered file system is that it allows us to create layers. Simply, for example, if you have on the, on the machine layer, uh, the basic file system that you have, basic whatever stuff you have, the operating system sits, and other dependent uh, elements that are needed as a part of the operating system, they are all sitting here. And you want to now add some special component that is required for an application, say application A. It requires some dependencies X and Z. And this other application requires, uh, uh, B requires X and Y. And this third one, application Z, requires uh, just an element called A. So the, these three things are what we, these are the dependent items. I call them dependencies. These are the things that are needed for this application to function correctly, right? So if we want to install these things, three different applications on a classic traditional model, we would have to do it in a fashion that allows, you know, a, a traditional model that will require a machine that has an operating system that then you know, if you want to go A here, then it requires that you have to have X first installed and then Z installed, and then you can put A on top. And that is one virtual machine in the traditional sense of it. In for this example, B, where you will have to have an operating system on its own, you put X on top, then put Y, and then put the B application on top. And the third one will be an operating system. You have a dependency called A, then you put the application Z on top, and you get these three different applications, one, two, and three, running in the traditional model. However, <clears throat> if you're doing it this way, as you know, there is some redundancy here. You're putting the operating system three times for no reason. You can probably do it with one, just one time, put an OS right here. If you have this X and X repeated twice, 
there is a level that you can optimize and maybe install it only once and reuse it for these two applications a and b and then have the appropriate dependency installed like that in form of a layer and then here you install a and then you put your z application on top that's the kind of optimization is technically possible if you use containerization and specifically layered file system so these are layers three layers and then the app layer this is the application layer this is the layer for the z or layer for y this is the layer for x this is the layer for operating system so multiple layers and we can actually just like git if you remember git just like git you can actually refer to these layers by their sha1 hashes and we will see them pretty soon we will have a method of creating our own layers we will create them in the next uh, few minutes and uh, you will see that they are pretty much similar to git in fact so much so that you can go back and forth uh, just like in a directed graph, you had this Git scenario where you have a beginning point and then you started creating your Tinker Toys and you could go travel like this and like that and either way like this if you like. And so those traversals are possible because you know that there is a specific marker that you can use to which are Shavan hashes. These are the hashes that you know. You could travel along your Git Tree structure, the, the the thing that is called a directed graph, you can traverse go up and down pretty much similar to that. You can also traverse these layers and you can actually change. I want that layer, I want this layer, and you can refer to these layers pretty much like you refer to the SHA hashes and you check out a particular hash and then your folder represents that particular hash. Pretty similar to that concept is this idea of layered file system where you could travel and you know take that layer if i want that layer just give me that layer refer to that layer by uh, referencing a particular sha hash and very similar to git is this thing called docker and like github uh, you know you know this github you have an account there now uh, there is this thing called docker hub and that is also conceptually similar to uh, your github and this is free uh, for most purposes this is also free for most purposes and i recommend that you open a new account open an account please and so that will help us put our own layered file system in here in in docker hub and we'll be able to share them in just the next few minutes or so so that is uh, what i would suggest open up an account on docker hub dockerhub.com or just hub.docker.com hub.docker Dot com is a place where you can open an account please do that having discussed this <clears throat> let us now discuss the second aspect the second critical aspect which is isolation now what is isolation the idea, idea behind isolation is you want to keep things separate from each other right so for example if you look at my desktop here you know you see that this machine and this machine and this phone and you know other things sitting around here they are all connected so that is how it is currently it is connected right so they are not truly isolated they are actually connected they could communicate they are indeed communicating in fact you will notice in my setup that i have just one keyboard and one mouse and i can operate using this three this this keyboard mouse combination i can operate on this machine this machine as well as this machine just just by traversing my mouse you can you can probably see this it is kind of crazy if you haven't seen this before but that's what i'm doing right now and i'll talk more about that later but the idea is these machines are not isolated they're not so what is isolation so think about it like this i buy a new device and i this is like just out of the factory the wi-fi is you know let's say disable the bluetooth disable network disabled airplane mode everything is you know completely uh, you know disconnected now i get this machine and i place it on the table like that and it's there 
Now, is this machine connected with anything else in my location? Not at all. It is in the airplane mode, Bluetooth turned off, Wi-Fi turned off, no cable connected, nothing. Right? It's totally isolated. That is how you should think about isolation. And that is how these app containers, application A, application B, application C, that we talked about are totally isolated from each other, even though they are sharing the common operating system. They're sharing actually one operating system under the hood. You saw this picture here, right? When I draw, when I draw the operating system, it was one actual operating system on the machine and the same setup here. But these three containers, that contain our applications, A, B, and C, are totally isolated, totally isolated. That means this isolation comes from the fact that the CPU, or maybe a portion of CPU, a portion is isolated. A portion of RAM is also isolated. A portion of disk is isolated. If there is some GPU, it will also be isolated. If there is some network activity, network connectivity, that is also isolated. So whatever resources you have are you know, basically dedicated to that particular container. This is not a VM, not, not a VM, but this illustration is that of a container. And in that container, you're not creating full-blown virtual machines, but making sure that the processes that run inside them are totally isolated isolated now what does, what does that boil down to it boils down to this that you know if you bring a machine like this place it on the table then it cannot communicate with anybody it can do nothing with anybody else unless you explicitly connect them so you have this container let's call it a this container let's call it b this container let's call it c and they are all sitting on a common operating system but they are isolated in that they cannot even talk to each other unless you open up a port and have them connect like that. Without this connection, if the connection is missing, they cannot communicate. That's the level of isolation is accomplished using a core technology in Linux. That technology is known as C groups or control groups. C groups, control groups. It, this technology is a part of Linux core kernel, and that is what is used under the hood to build the capability around isolation. So practically speaking, they are separate isolated placeholders for an application. They will contain an application. The word usage is contain an application. This word has a very specific meaning. Let us see the meaning. The meaning in English language has a very succinct meaning to it. Let's go understand what that meaning actually is. So contain. And uh, let's say contain. The meaning is, uh, this is the dictionary definition. This is Wikipedia. Oh, not contain a store, but contain. <laughs> okay, contain. The word is contain. So contain means, the second meaning is more uh, clear, to control or to restrain, to limit, to curb, that's the meaning, right, to restrain, to curb, to suppress, to, to stifle, to subdue, those, those are the kind of meanings which is to hold something, to limit something in a specific fashion. So this the word contain basically translates to you trying to contain the application within the boundary of the container. That's the idea behind isolation, that you limit the application should not be able to impact anything else outside. It should contain itself. It should limit itself, stay focused on what it is supposed to do. And anything that goes bad here should not impact anything else that may be happening here or here inside a same machine running the same operating system. So if you if this goes bonkers and really bad, it should not be a problem at all. This should be happy and happy. 
they should continue their business just like usual business as usual only the bad things are contained in this container contained that's the way you should think about a container so that's uh, that, that's what i just told you now let us see a uh, couple more ideas here a uh, couple more ideas about containers so this uh, i'll go back now to the documentation on docker hub so in our docker hub location you will find no not docker hub this this uh, documentation which is where i will describe some of the core ideas about some of the keywords that uh, people use in the context of this product so if you go to the docker documentation site which is docs.docker.com that's what i'm heading right now and you will see how do you get docker so for you it is very simple you have it already you have it in that virtual workstation and we'll get to use it in just a minute so that that's how you get now how did i install that you can see that i have installed it on docker for linux using this method on ubuntu you can see that these are the steps that i followed like to get docker for ubuntu that's what i followed exactly to make sure that that virtual machine has docker installed and you can see that lots of steps that's what i completed and it's there for you so you don't have to do these things to run docker on other operating systems you could just go along like that for example docker is now available on windows so if you are a windows user and you install this package it is totally fine you just remember one thing that when you install this package by default it will run linux docker not the windows docker by default it runs linux docker you have to actually change it over to run microsoft docker the the, the capability now exists these days they have a capability to run you can do either or or not both together at the same time only one choice the default choice is even if you are on windows platform the the uh, the idea that you install docker on windows will let you run linux containers in that infrastructure not microsoft you have to actually change it over then start using microsoft windows docker which is a different idea altogether works functionally the same way conceptually the same way it functions just like that but it is not linux just want you to remember that now that is docker for windows it's also available on windows server and available on bunch of clouds like amazon cloud and azure cloud and basically it doesn't even matter which cloud you can make it run on any machine in any cloud it doesn't even matter one more thing it is also available on macintosh which i think i will show you that piece i have it ready and ready for you so that's the getting part it's fairly easy to actually obtain docker and run it uh, but that's not the part the part is to understand what are we going to do with it and so to get started you will see that there are some uh, some simple concepts the one concept that i described already is this idea of a container the container idea let's go revisit that briefly so the idea behind a container is something like this you begin with a machine sorry you know, grab the pen and you begin with a machine so here is a machine for example it has an operating system already and your idea is to have this machine installed docker so once that is in place what you then do is create a container how do you create a container in the context of docker you basically say that docker please run something so docker run something run something here what is that something that something is called an image image so that's a new word an image is something that is a picture a snapshot a snapshot of what it is a snapshot of a container so whatever you want to run when you run that thing the image it runs a container and then you have a running container that that runs your application runs your services whatever you have in that image so an image is like a file and a container is like execution environment so imagine this setup you know you have this uh, word dot exe do you know what this thing is this is a file that sits in your programs c colon c colon slash programs slash something something folder that's where it it sits 
the file name is word.exe. Now, when you execute that thing, this thing starts to run. So for example, here is Microsoft Word somewhere here. So that is, oh, say, let's say Excel. So this is the Excel program. So I can click on it and then it starts Excel. So this is the runtime representation of Excel. And you can see it. I can close it and that disappeared. I can also examine the runtime listing of that thing. This thing is called the task manager. You can see it in task manager. For example, task manager will show you what tasks are running. So right now I have this, uh, this one note thing running, it should be showing in the task manager, just like that, uh, somewhere here. Come on, so there is this one note running right there. So that's an instance of an application executing inside this Windows machine. Whereas this, this file that sits in my, for my, my whatever this thing is called, folder, directory, Directory. I think I don't know what Windows will use as the word directory or folder, but one of those. If you go to this PC, then go to my drive, and then go to program files, and then find out uh, Microsoft Office, and then here somewhere you will find, you know, that thing called OneNote somewhere in there. That's where you will expect to find it. And so that's the idea: is that 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 thing that you saw in the file system is a is a executable file. When you run it, it becomes a running process. So back to what we are discussing in the context of uh, Docker. There is a Docker image. When you run that image, it runs like a container. So a container is more like a running living thing, a running thing. Whereas this is a storage thing. You store stuff. So stored, stored thing. Now, where do you store these things? Uh, you store them typically in a Docker uh, hub, for example, is a good place to store. So hub.docker.com, that location, you will find a lot of images. And then you can then run them. When you run them, they become a container, a running thing that will run something. So now let us do some examples. And I will switch away from this display over to the other display, which will show us live demonstrations so you should be able to run these things yourself also and i'm switching my my desktop right now and switching over to a place where i can demonstrate something and i will open up my virtual machine and in there you will find docker we'll use that ready-made docker already installed and we'll just make use of it so that is starting up right now in there and we will make use of uh, a basic example to begin with. <clears throat> I'm waiting for it to start. I think I'm projecting. Am I projecting my screen? Uh, probably not. Hold on, let's see. So checking if I am projecting, I am projecting my screen. Yes, yes. And here's the workstation. And I'm going to start my terminal as a beginning point. And so there is my terminal. Now, let's first thing first. Do I have Docker? Do I have Docker? Docker PS, enter. And I see like, you know, it looks like Docker is available there. It doesn't have anything running. So if you go and examine Docker, sorry, uh, Docker info, you will see some of the details of the setup that I have in my workstation, which are defined here. You see that running container zero. Uh, paused containers, stop containers, number of images, zero. All of these things are zero. There is a version 1.13.1. There is a storage driver for an AUFS file system, which is the layered file system I talked about. Then you will also see that there's a C group driver, C group FS, which is the control uh, piece of package that basically allows isolation, separation of contained environments, which is where this container system will run. You will also see a couple of other things. For example, uh, interesting thing is this thing, a kernel. This kernel is the version of kernel that I have running on this hardware, which is what we have. So if you check the kernel on the machine itself, you will find it is running 44062. That is the same kernel that this 
Docker will just make use of. So it will actually use the existing kernel I have on the real machine and make use of it. That same kernel, the same underlying OS will be reused. You will also see that this particular machine has some total memory allocation, about 4 GB. It has a workstation, the name is Cloud Workstation, and a bunch of other details. So we'll go through details later on. So that, that's the installation we have. You will also notice that the number of images I have, zero. Any containers running, zero. Okay, got that. Now, if I want to run a container, what do I need to do? I told you that I need to get an image from somewhere and then I can execute the image to run a container. So one of the images that I want to run is uh, say uh, something like uh, a hello world, a simple example to begin with. So I will say docker run hello world. That should be the name if I remember right. Hello world is the name of an image, this name. Let us go cross check that if it is actually a name. So I want to run docker run hello world. What does that do? Let's go find out first of all, there is an image or not. So we'll go to uh, docker hub. And in there, we'll try to look for this image called hello world. So here is the docker hub location. I'm going to sign in. Uh, signing in is not necessary, but I just want to sign in to show you a couple other capabilities. So here I will search on the top, say hello world. And I try to look for it and there is an official image for hello world. This hello world image is the official repository made available by Docker. And the way to use it is to pull the image first. Docker pull hello world, that's how you pull it. In our example, I am not pulling it, I'm just running it without pulling. And so if you do that, what happens? If you try to run Docker run hello world when you don't have the image locally, if you see I don't have Docker images, any images do not exist, nothing here. But I still attempt to run uh, something like Docker run hello world. What do you think will happen? If I run this, say enter, what do you think will happen? Anybody? Any guesses? Nobody? <laughs> what do you, what do you, I just unmuted you guys. So tell me what do you think will happen if I uh, just run when I don't have the image? Get an error. Uh, very good answer, but it's not the right answer. Though. So <laughs> it's a very logical way of thinking that you get an error, but it is unfortunately not the right answer because what Docker does, as you will see, is if you don't find an image, go get it don't cause an error for no reason just go get the image and then run it so here we go i'm going to run it it says i cannot find the image so let me go and get it and so it goes and gets it it says i did not find an image unable to find the image locally so let me go and get it so it, it pulls the image from the hello world location on docker hub and it pulls complete and you get a hash this hash is 7844 Let's go match the hash here. So the ma matching hash number somewhere here you should be able to find is, uh, where is the hash here? Maybe they don't publish hash on the website, but the hash is there now. So Docker images should show you an image. The hash num image ID number is 4B, sorry, uh, 448B5. So this image ID is not correct. What is the right one then? Uh, where is this 48B5? I'll get to it. Hold on. Uh, image ID. Okay. I am a little bit confused as to why this image ID doesn't match what I see, but we'll get to that later. Let's go finish this discussion quickly. So, uh, Docker run hello world doesn't find it locally, gets the machine, gets the machine image downloaded. The image comes down like a SHA 256 hash and then it downloads a version a image from hello world latest image and then runs it so when it runs you see a response this is the response hello from docker that's it that's the response and subsequent messages are also 
a part of the overall response and the messages actually finish all the way up to this point. So this is the message that we see when we run hello world, which is hello from Docker. This message shows you that installation appears to be working correctly and all that good stuff. So you can read all that. That's just a help text that is emitted on the screen just to tell you that it ran successfully. You now see Docker images shows you there is one image. You also see that there is a dead process, Docker, yes, dash A. If you see all the processes, there is a dead process, the dead process that exited successfully two minutes ago. And this process was created two minutes ago. And what it did was ran a command called hello. And in the image called hello world, the image had a different container ID, which is this ID. And that ID is the container ID, as opposed to this ID is the image ID. So we'll talk more about ID in just a minute. But just remember that this is an image, which is basically a file that came down from this website here uh, when, when it pulled the Hello World image. And this instantiation is a container. It ran the image Hello World and it ran two minutes ago and it died after it ran that's a expected behavior when you have something like a hello world printing on the screen it finishes doing its job and then it is done doing its thing so it dies and it's expected to exit so it exited successfully with a zero uh, as an argument and now you have nothing running you can see nothing is running by checking docker ps you see that there's nothing there so that's just a simple, quick example. But let's go build something, something more important, something more e that we can comprehend and digest better. So now I will throw uh, a new idea at you. Here, uh, the kernel that we have running here is uh, you, you name is the kernel version is four four zero six two, and the version of uh, the operating system I'm running here is. Uh, release uh, it is running Ubuntu 14.04 that's what you see here from the Etsy release uh, files so you know that the machine that I'm dealing with is an Ubuntu machine 14.04 and the kernel version is 44062 you got it now I will show you somewhat an unbelievable thing and so just watch it now what I will show you is I will now run in a separate window, uh, this window, which is just opened up on the right side. In that window, I will run a different Linux, just now, like this, Docker run CentOS. Uh, send, hold on, let me run it. Uh, Docker run, yeah, CentOS is the operating system I want to run. It's a different OS. It doesn't exist locally, so it is getting pulled. It is pulling from Docker library right now. And it is a 70 megabyte image, not that big, so it will come down and run. And you will see that it, it ran. That is nice. Now, it'll run and finish. It will basically do nothing and finish and exit. That's what you will see in the output window. While it does, on, on that screen, I will open another terminal on the left side and say Docker run Debian. So I'm getting another operating system downloaded in the lower left window. And a fourth one here, Docker run Ubuntu and the latest version, not the 14.04, but the latest that we can get. So that's the Ubuntu latest coming down locally. And as we see that this thing finished, it downloaded a newer image and the run step finished successfully. This one also downloaded Debian image and it finished successfully. This one is downloading that Ubuntu latest version and will finish shortly. Now, when that three of these things finish, I would like to now show you something that is uh, kind of crazy to think about when you're looking at it first time. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate now. So I think we have three new operating system images available. Let's go see them. Docker images. What do we have? We have the Hello World. This is the Hello World. Uh, the CentOS. Debian and Ubuntu latest. These 
three operating systems are distinctly different Linux machines, uh, Linux OSs in these three images. We have the image ID, one, two, and three, and they are available to our system locally. Now that we have these three images available, we'll ignore the, the, ignore the hello world for now. We don't have to worry about it. We're done with it. So in this window on the upper right corner, what I will do is get Docker to give me an interactive terminal command inside the CentOS image. I want it to run a container. So something like Docker run cont container CentOS and uh, give me the uh, uh, give me the bash prompt in there. Uh, okay, hold on. I think I'm missing uh, missing a syntax so i'm missing a syntax hold on let me see if uh, how do how do you write that uh, let me remember uh, remind myself of that syntax i think i missed the syntax part so somewhere i had to go and read uh, docker run how did i forget that command <laughs> okay docker run bash in a container oh Okay. Oh, there's a cheat sheet. That's a good one. Yeah, I just found a cheat sheet. So that should challenge. That should immediately tell us. Okay, there we go. I, I remember now. So I will give you the cheat sheet also. That's a good one, by the way. And you should have it. So here is that cheat sheet uh slack chat and risk pasted that cheat sheet for you there's a question here from sandeep says one other question you have shown us how to build a platform on ias will you be showing us how to build an ias solution or pool of hardware yes uh, we need pool of hardware and we don't have it so you have it by the way sandeep. you have it in your company isn't that what something like open is supposed to do correct yes will we be doing it reviewing it yes but I don't have a hardware to demonstrate that to you. That's the unfortunate problem, but you have it internally and I'll guide you how to go and do it. So we'll get there, not right now. Okay, back here. So uh, this thing that I am attempting to do in the upper right corner window is to get a container running CentOS and then connect to it and give me a prompt, give me a bash prompt. That's what I'm attempting to connect. The way to write that is like this, Docker. Uh, uh, run interactively in teletypewriter mode give me a uh, sorry the way to read this in english language would be docker run dash it dash i for interactive t for teletypewriter uh, use the centos image and give me a bash prompt that's how the syntax works so when i run it that i get something different what do i get it is the user and cloud genius workstation that prompt changed you will see that the prompt is now root at something. That's a different prompt. Now let us see what kernel this is. The kernel is the same that you have here. You name is the same exact kernel, right? However, however, the key difference you will see is that this thing is actually sent to us. And so this machine is the actual machine. It is Ubuntu, but this machine, this command prompt I have is from a CentOS Linux. Now on the bottom left corner, I will, what I will do is same thing, but in a Debian container. So Docker run dash interactive teletypewriter mode, please run Debian for me and give me a bash prompt. So it does. You will check that the kernel is still the same. It is still the same kernel we have in the real machine, except our operating system that we have is Debian. Jesse, Debian Jesse right there. And this one, the bottom right corner, I'll do the same thing, but with a different operating system. So I'll go Docker run dash IT, which is to run it interactively. Give me a teletypewriter command prompt using the Ubuntu latest and inside there, give me a bash prompt. So I get it and I check my kernel 
it is still the same one but the operating system is not the ubuntu version i have but a later version of ubuntu 16.04 as, as opposed to 14.04 so now you have at this moment we have three containers this is container running centos this container is running debian and this container is running ubuntu latest three containers running right now in my real computer they are completely isolated from each other completely isolated okay having said that i will now go back to the main machine up in the upper right upper left corner and see what containers do i have running so docker ps and it shows me i have three let us go see what they are so I, i'll just read it a little bit better i'll say you know adjust my font size and show me what you got so still still not interesting i will adjust this a little bit more and make it readable a little bit better and then docker ps now i see that there are three containers running right now this started three minutes ago this started about a minute ago another minute ago this is the ubuntu latest running bash command this is the debian running bash command centos running bash command and i have three different containers this is the number one number two debian and number three sent oh this is ubuntu latest so three containers now i will ask you a question and i'll, I'll actually show you what i'm doing and i'll ask you a yes or no question the question is in this machine which is on the upper right corner which is my centos machine i want to delete something crazy like you know for example i go to the list and i find that there is this critical files in the in the <coughs> uh say bin folder for example so i see that there is a user bin there is a etc folder very critical folders right so i want to run something like sudo rm dash rf slash etc should i do this slash bin slash lib slash uh, something like that should i should i execute this command is it okay that's the question is it going to hurt me am i shooting myself in the foot that's the question what do you think that terminal would cease to work correct that is true that particular window will stop working it will die the machine becomes defunct but what about this machine the actual machine will it bother do no. i care no, nothing will happen to others because it is totally isolated and i'll prove it now i'll go shoot myself in the foot in that centos which i did apparently sudo command not found it is already root so i'll re i'll remove sudo and here we go so remove sudo and say shoot myself in the foot and the machine kind of defunct so i can do nothing about it now so ls works but then you know maybe i should delete more <laughs> so like uh, rm minus rf slash lib 64 and opt and you you get the drift the idea is i am randomly shooting my foot uh, for no reason other than to illustrate a point that i'm going nuts with that machine and you would not do this on a real computer but you can do it on a container it's so totally contained this machine still fine nothing no, nothing wrong with it it doesn't impact anything else in fact these machines are also doing okay no problem in fact that window of the that particular contain that container that is kind of defunct and it's not usable anymore because i shot myself in the foot in there i quit i come out and then i open another window and here i check docker es dash you know show me all the dead processes as well as running processes this dash a means all whereas this without dash a just means show me all the running ones so all the running ones we have only two now the debian and ubuntu that's it two the two at the bottom but if you see all the dead ones dash a it can show you lots of them for example it shows you the the ubuntu latest that we downloaded debian we downloaded centos downloaded and then the hello world is also there so all these dead ones are showing i want to i want to basically start another container so here we go 
I'll say Docker run interactively. Give me CentOS and give me bash prompt. And I get a fresh, clean, new container using the CentOS image running right there. And this is a good functional container with completely all things in place, like a new fresh CentOS operating system. And you can see that Docker PS shows me three. The one called CentOS is this one. You can even match the ID number of the container. It's 888B, what is that thing? 8DB. Yeah, that number matches this number, container ID. This ID number here, 80ECHO8, that number matches the, the Ubuntu ID here. Why did I open this close? And the third one is Charlie9DeltaEcho. It matches the Debian ID. So three containers running, and you can create more containers. They are very efficient in terms of their resource consumption. They're totally isolated. As you can see that you already saw, I shot myself in the foot in one of them. It did not bother, did not disturb anything else. You can totally do that. It is isolated. It, is, it has its own process space, memory space, disk space, network space. Everything about it is completely isolated. That's something you should remember. And now, uh, the idea about creating layers. So let's go see what does it mean. And for that, I will introduce a new concept. This concept is called a Docker file. That's the foundation of beginning to create layers in your file system. So we'll, we'll, we'll change my screen layout a little bit and then go to a different screen where, I can, where, you, where you can see me write stuff. So stopping share on this one and then starting sharing on the other computer to see what I'm writing. And here it comes. Okay, where is that thing? Share my desktop. Here we go. And here is my notepad. And I will now write. So the idea that I'm describing next, we discussed and, and saw a live demo of this thing called isolation. I think uh, you, most of you saw how it works. At least you saw, and I hope you understood. If you did not really completely understand this isolation aspect, please ask questions. Now, having discussed that, let's talk about the other idea about layers. How do you put layers into practice? So that putting layers in practice, there is a structure that I will define, which is called a Docker file. Cap, it has to be capital D, by the way. This has to be capital Docker file. That file is what we will define as to what it means. And uh, from a practical perspective, it basically means a series of instructions. Series of steps to do. This, this is what we will do step by step. Step number one, step number two, step number three and go on like that. And uh, we will begin from a good foundation. So we will know it is good to begin with, and then we will build stuff. And we will, you know, add some things. Uh, we will, uh, you know, modify something, or run something, and like that. And, and these are the steps we intend to do. And everything that we do, every step that we create becomes a layer. Every time we add something, it is basically considered a separate layer by itself. Uh, every line will translate into a layer and it will build as a consequence. It will build when you run the Docker file, asking it to build an image, it will actually construct an image a new image now we will like to like i said here we will begin with a known good foundation so i will ask you this question what is a good foundation a good foundation is something that everybody knows and likes and trusts for example a good foundation could mean beginning from red hat linux or beginning from Ubuntu Linux, 
just <laughs> Ubuntu Linux or beginning from Debian or any of those operating systems, like whatever you can think of, the basic solid foundation of the, the giants in the industry. Like you begin from a rock solid foundation, you begin from a good known base that I will call core. Or I will also use another word called J-E-O-S. Just enough operating system. What does this basically mean? Is that it contains everything that you need to run containers, but nothing else, like just the bare minimum. Just the bare minimum to get your stuff working. That's all it has. I mean, that's how you define this word. It is pronounced juice, by the way, juice. This idea is called juice. Well, you get just the bare minimum of an operating system and that you use as a foundation. So just the core components of Red Hat or Ubuntu or Debian or CoreOS or this Linux or that Linux, just the basic, just the bare minimum. I think that constitutes a very good solid foundation because it contains, and I will use a technical word, it contains no crap. <laughs> That's what I would like to have, absolutely zero crap. So just the bare minimum, and that's a technical word, by the way. That was a joke. Uh, having said, uh, when you don't have these things, you know, uh, then you don't want crap because you know it, it. It basically bloats the whole thing. You don't want unnecessary stuff. You just want the bare good, bare minimum good stuff. So that is what the industry has done already. By the way, is created these kind of basic beginning points like Red Hat and Ubuntu and Debian. By the way, Red Hat is uh, used as CentOS in the context of Docker because CentOS gives you a Red Hat clone image. So that's what you will see. And that's what you saw in the in our example that I just ran is that people end up using CentOS as the foundation because it's a clone of Red Hat. Now, when you begin from something as solid as standardized distribution like CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, and a bunch of other operating systems, like in the Windows land, there is this thing called I, I'm forgetting its full name. I think it's called Windows Server uh, Core Operating System. Uh, no, no, Windows Server Core 2016. Maybe that's the name. But forget the name. The idea is Core. And unfortunate part with Windows Core is it is like five gigabytes. And that's a way too big number to have. Because these guys are like 70 MBs and 8 MBs, 70 MBs. It's a very small, tiny, tiny, just enough Linux. That's what you will see when you look at these images. So that's the beginning point. Now here, a good foundation. You begin from a good foundation, and then you add whatever you want, and you build your layered structure. And that's what you put down in a Docker file. And then you say, Docker, build it. Now when you build, what happens is it creates an image. It basically has a beginning image. Then you, in your Docker file, you add things, you subtract things, you modify things, uh, and you do whatever you want. And then you end up with Whoa. a result. So this is your beginning image, which you basically begin from say Ubuntu, for example. And then you make your changes along the way, and then you end up with a new image. So when you create this new image, it is basically a layer of these layers, multiple layers stacked on top of this thing. And that's how a layered file system gets in place for you. You're basically transitioning yourself from this beginning point all the way to this point and creating your image. And you define whatever that image contains in a Docker file. And so let us now create a very, very simple Docker file and play with it. So I will now switch my screens again, go to a terminal and show you my uh, example that I will run live. So here we go, sharing my screen again and opening up my virtual workstation, which is this one. 
and I'm going to kill these guys. Like, you know, these three containers running, I just exit from there. And so I'll just go bye bye, bye bye, and bye bye. And now I have these processes running all dead, but nothing there. And uh, as soon as you exit a Docker container, it dies because there is nothing further to do. And that's why it dies. And so now you have lots of dead bodies right there. And so I want to clean them up. I can clean them up in a cleanup command. Uh, you can find in the cheat sheet, but the cleanup goes something like this. Uh, Docker rm -f, uh, Docker ps-aq. And so it cleans up all. And so now you have Docker ps-a showing nothing cleaned. So all the dead processes gone, all the containers gone, nothing is there, except you still have images. So I kept them. I did not kill them. You can get rid of an image if you don't like something like I don't want the hello world at all. So I press a Docker images, image RM, hello world, and it removes that image. So Docker images should not show you any anymore. That hello world is gone. So now I have Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS 3 operating system images. Their sizes are very small, as you can see, 123 MB, 192 MB. So it's fairly small images. Compare to compare that to uh, something like here. Uh, Docker pull Windows Server Core. And here, uh, this thing is like five gigabytes. It's gigantic. This this thing, if you pull, you can pull it not on a window. On, you need a Windows machine and Windows Docker to pull this. And uh, that's how you can pull. But if you attempt to pull on a Linux box, it will not function properly. And uh, that's the challenge. It is a gigantic package, even though it is just the core. But that's the legacy of Microsoft. Having said, now let us move back to our workstation and start building an image. To begin with, our image will be very, very simple. I will begin by creating a folder. A folder I will call Docker test. And then go, in there, go inside there. And I will mute you guys again. I think I accidentally unmuted all of you. I will mute you guys. All of you muting you. If you need to unmute yourself, you can always do that. I am muting you. You can unmute and talk if you like. And so uh, what I will now do is go back here and discuss this idea of creating a folder like I just did and then opening that folder in Atom. So that folder is opening up, it's an empty folder. And in that folder, we have nothing. So we'll create something and the thing will be called Docker file. So let's go to that. This will contain a new file and the file will contain a new file. Come on, new file, file, new file. And in that file, I will call this is my Docker file. This is my Docker file. So I'll save it as the name Docker file with a capital D and save. So that's my Docker file. Now this is a comment. So I should comment it out and save. And I'll make it a little big so you can see. So this is my Docker file. And on the other hand, I have this terminal open, which I want to use. So I'll keep that on the side. Now, I want to build this image. I know my beginning point has to be some solid foundation, right? So my foundation I decide I will use from Ubuntu. And the name is very specific. I think it has to be lowercase if I remember right, but I haven't tried the uppercase ever. So maybe, maybe today is a good time to try, but I don't want to experiment, but let's give it a shot. So uppercase, I think doesn't matter, but keep lowercase because that's the standard naming convention of a basic image in the library. So match the name that the library has. So for example, if you go uh, in your uh, Docker Hub location and try to find out what is the image for Ubuntu, it will tell you the Ubuntu name is, and that name is coming up. Come on, I typed. And the name is lowercase Ubuntu. So that's what you should use. So it's like Ubuntu. That's the lowercase name you should use, not the uppercase. So I'll, I'll go back to lowercase. Now that's my foundation. Now if I just leave my Docker file just like that and close it here and go back here to my terminal and say list. So I have it. My Docker file exists. That looks like this. 
and I want to now build an image. I can very easily do that like this Docker build and say build whatever I have in this folder. So I'll say dot Docker build dot meaning build whatever I have in this folder. So it in that folder I have this file called Docker file. So it will look at the Docker file and build it. Attempt to build this Docker file. What does it do? Let's go see. It says I'm done. And it did so quickly because it did not do nothing actually. All it did was build an image based on an existing image, but no other change. So you now have an image that's available to you, but it is basically nothing different from Ubuntu. Ubuntu latest. Because that's what the foundation was that you began with. However, I want to do something different. I want to make this image my own. So I will say, I would like to add something to the image. And I would like to add a file. Which file? This file. File, new file, this file called a file. And that file I want to add in this folder. First of all, I have to create that file. The file is called a file and I will save it. And that file is available right there that you can see it. That a file is available. I would like to have that file show up inside my image. So I have to go and basically copy that file to the image inside. So when I run this Docker file, I would like that a file to go inside the image. So that's how you would send. So I save this structure and this a file, this file should show up in the image I create in the slash location. That's my expectation is I would like to have this particular file show up in the slash location. And that's what I expect to see happen when I run my Docker build command. I expect this file should actually go inside an image. So let's go see that if it happens. So I'll say Docker build again, like this. So it builds. And you can see that there are two steps now. Step number one is use the foundation. Step number two, copy this file called a file from the current location, which is this location over this from this location over to the slash location inside the image. That's what I just said in the Docker file. And that's what it did for us. So now, it said successfully built this image 3D3A. So we, can, we should be able to see it. Docker images, what do we got? We have an image 3D3A that was built for us, but it doesn't have a name, doesn't have a tag. It was created 47, 41 seconds ago and the size is 117 MB. How big is the Ubuntu image? 117 MB. Do you see a reason why is the same size, approximately the same size? Because we did not add much. We just added a simple text file. The image contains our actual text file. Let us go see it. So I want to run this image, the 3D3 image. So what I will do is I'll say, Docker, run that image, please. Give me an interactive command prompt in the 3D3 image and give me a bash prompt in there. This 3D3 is a shorthand to this full image ID. I don't have to say the whole thing. I could, but I did not. And that's the shorthand to this hash. I can use the first three, first four, first five, whatever, whatever I like and make that as a proxy to the image, which is what this thing is. And then I say, give me a bash prompt. So I get the bash prompt. I get that new container running root. And I see that I am in the slash location. And in that location, I see that there is a file called a file. I just modified and created a new image with my own content. And I can open that file called a file and I can see it. It says this file should show up in the image I create 
in the slash location. This is exactly what we have in that file. Now, I will. what I will do is come out of the container. So now I have this Docker images and I will look at my folder structure. I have the Docker file that looks like this and I have that A file. And what I want to do now is to create a properly named image. So I can name it appropriately. So I can recognize it as opposed to this, as opposed to this hash, I would like to give it a name, a tag. So I will say Docker build with a dash T option and give it a tag called cloud genius slash and then uh, give it a good name like a file and then ask it to build it using the folder containing in the current location dot and then I say build so it quickly builds it all it does is basically changes the tag you can see the tag applied now here so this file a file image cloud genius name is the name tag that I have with the latest tag created three minutes ago even though I just did it the build happened like a few seconds ago it still says three minutes ago because it did not do anything all it did was attach the tag and that was the tag I gave so it applied the tag right there now why did I tag it I tagged it with a specific purpose in mind what I want to do is give that image to you now so I will give this to you how do I give this to you it's the same idea as git I will need to push it push where to docker hub so we'll go to docker hub and here I have this location where I have a look I have an account and I could I could push an image so I will take my image this image and give it to all of you right now I need to I need to basically docker push and then cloud genius uh, a file I should be able to push it just like that but I haven't provided my login password yet which I should do before I execute this command but if I don't provide my login and password it will cause an error which is expected so here I attempt to push and it says access denied Ac requested access to the resource is denied because I did not provide my login password so I should so here we go docker login and I log in like my docker docker credentials and I type it I go grab my password and then I'll provide that password to it and here is my password I'll go back to my terminal and paste my password and there it goes logged in succeeded successfully logged in now I can push my custom created image to docker hub and it will push now while it, while it pushes it will show up here somewhere here and i would like to see it so i will basically go and say show me my image and here it is saying not found however the push should succeed first it is still pushing and so when it pushes completely that URL will become available that URL will become available at this location right now it says 404 because it doesn't exist the push is still happening it finished so yeah it should it should it, it finished now I should be able to open this browser again and see my image and so here it is it says <coughs> cloud genius a file that image is available to all of you publicly available and that image you can pull like that and you can also run just like that so the way to run this in your computer will be something like this you first pull it and then you run it how do you run it you run like this I'm typing it for you in the slack chat and here you can see that you can ask it to give you a bash prompt and when you get a new bash prompt you should be able to find the file called a file and you should be able to cat it and that is the file called a file in your image that I just sent to you through docker hub like this 
And so please go ahead, give it a shot. It doesn't take long. It's a half a minute, 30 second operation. Give it a shot and tell me if you succeed in seeing this A file in your container, which you will run using the steps that I provide here in Slack chat. The steps are these, and I will open them up in a editor to see, make you see clearly. And those steps are these guys, which is first you pull, then you run and get a bash prompt. And then you see the file there, and then you cat it. That's the idea. So tell me if you saw it. Tell me if you see my image. Tell me if you successfully download and run and pull and clone and run my image. And uh, you see the content, the custom content that I just out, out of uh, the Docker file structure, I created to illustrate a point, which is you can create your own images based on a layer definition that you provide in a Docker file that goes like this one layer on top of the foundation, which is line number three. Let's see. I'm going to unmute you guys so you can talk. Anybody? Yeah. yeah, I'm not on my regular machine, so I don't have the virtual machine. Oh, okay, no worries. No worries. No worries. But those of you who have it, uh, give it a shot, see how it works, and tell me that it did. Or tell me that it didn't, <laughs> either way. <laughs> yeah, I got it, it all work. <clears throat> oh, sweet, 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 sweet. So uh, let us uh, discuss the next topic now a little bit. It is an extension of the same idea, uh, however, slightly different. So uh, we will build on these ideas further. <clears throat> but maybe we take a short break and then resume. So why don't we do that? We take a short break of say a few minutes and then resume our discussion in building the concepts of Docker as a technology and uh, we'll understand some of the more detailed parts of it and then get to a point where we can run our own application of some sorts. That's what I intend to do. And so uh, 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 we'll, we'll start a timer right now. Here we go. And run that uh, timer for timer, say seven minutes. What is this? One hour 41? No. Seven minutes. Okay, now it's good. So now this timer is actually reasonable. That was one hour, 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Okay, I think I'm back. Uh, I hope you are back too. Just quickly checking. No, they said free root, free gutter cleaning. Ooh. No, no, when we got our new gutters. Okay, uh, so uh, we are ready to start again. And we just discussed this uh, idea of uh, creating an image, right? We began with some basic uh, foundation like this one and then we added something modified something created inter inter created intermediate steps towards getting our own image we also did something different this time apart from what is drawn in the picture is we took this image and pushed it pushed to docker hub and once i pushed that docker hub image i was able to get a link for you and you were able to pull that image, pull it on your machine here, and you were able to run it yourself. You ran docker run dash it, and you used the image name that I have provided, and you got a bash prompt in there. And you were able to find the changes that I made using my docker file. I in, inserted a new file in here. The file was called a file, and that file showed up in your runtime environment which is your container running my image 
That's how people, companies, and uh, you know, people like you and me can create images and share it with other people. That's the idea behind Docker Hub. It's about sharing and collaborating using Docker images. So we discussed a couple of things up until now, like creating and identifying layers, uh, create uh, understanding this concept of isolation. Now, yes, sir. Uh, Hold on, I think I muted everybody again. And so if you want to un unmute yourself, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk if you need to. Uh, the other thing that I would like to discuss next is this idea of you know, actually making connections, network connections. That's what I would like to now illustrate with an example. So <clears throat> this idea of a network connection between containers, uh, between a physical machine that runs so this is the machine that you have, and you have an operating system here, and you run a container here, and another container here, and things like that. And so if this is an application running here, it has its own self-contained everything, right? All of it isolated. And so if you want to run something here, like this application, and you want to expose this application to a real person here, and uh, that person has an iPhone, and so that iPhone has a browser, and in that browser, they are opening up some web address, and they will hit port number 80 on that HTTP location that you have, and that will hit your real machine, for example. But this real machine is completely isolated from your container. This is your container running A. This is your container running B. And these guys are completely isolated from the real world. So this person, if he or she wants to access that application A, there is no direct way to get there because it is totally isolated. So we have to make network connections between this application and this person. That's what we will discuss next. How do we do that? So <clears throat> effectively, what we need to be able to see is from the user's perspective, the user will want to visit port number 80 on this box. And this box will have some operating system running. It will have the port number 80 open so that this traffic will flow. Request and response. All these things will flow properly. However, we need to account for this transaction, this transaction, HTTP transaction that is happening, for example, uh, in between not just this person and his device and our machine here, but also translate that over to a container. And this container is the, is the one that is running this application. And it is running that application A, which should show up here, by the way. And uh, this is running and exposing itself on port number 80 here, but it is not connected to anything else. So we have to map that thing between this 80 to this 80. That mapping has to be created like this. And that mapping is what we are going to show you with an example. So the idea behind this kind of a mapping is called the port mapping. This port mapping happens with a dash P option. Uh, something like this. It, it is written something pretty much like this. You map a port 80 to the real machine port 80. So this is the container port 80, the real machine port 80. That's how you write container mappings in the context of a command. Pretty much like that. And once you do that and you instantiate this particular container with this kind of an argument, it will map ports just like what is described. You know, map port 80 inside the container to the port number 80 in the physical machine so that this user can get access all the way to your app. That's what we want. So we have to invoke a run of a container with arguments like this in order for us to 
expose that property, the characteristics inside of that particular container and show it outside. If you just run it without it, it doesn't work because it is isolated. That's expected. So now I will show a live example as to what it means. So we will build another container and uh, you know, container image and then run it in a container. And I will switch sharing. <clears throat> so back to my virtual machine. What I am doing now is instead of instead of this thing uh, called Ubuntu as my base as my foundation, I would like to use something that is like ready made. So just a quick start, right? So what I would like to go is go here and say if I can get some ready made web server. So there is a ready made web server available called Engine X. That's what we'll use. So here is a Engine X official image available. So we'll click on that and read about it. It says, if you want to receive this image, you need to pull Nginx. So we'll pull it. We'll go say Docker pull Nginx, and we'll go and pull it. So it pulls. OK. I see there's a question in chat. So we'll look at that. And the response is, Chris says, it works great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, now, we are pulling this container, sorry, this image called Nginx, and we want to run it. But I want to read about it. What is what is this? What does this do for us? So that's what I will briefly read. It tells me that you know it is you know running something here. So how to use this image? It tells us that. So we'll go read hosting some simple static content. If you want to host some content, you want to run it like this. And so it is describing how to run that image specifically. So we will read that line, understand it, and see if we can run it like that. And that's a simple one-liner command. It is giving us an example. So we'll implement that example pretty much like this. So let's go read. It says Docker run, give it some name, and then map some folder structure and run an image called Nginx in daemon mode and i'll describe what daemon mode is so this idea of running something giving it a name some random name and then running it like a daemon and this dash d option line number six this option basically says that you know what most containers will exit at the end of the run but i would like this container to be to be running all the time so make it run, keep it running all the time. That's my goal. So I want to run it like a daemon in the background. That's why this dash D option allows me to do that. Now, this part is just assigning a random name to it, some random name that you like. It, it's not that critical. But just giving it a name is a nice thing to have. Now, the last one is this segment. This idea is called volume mapping. Just like we briefly discussed this idea for dash P and AT colon AT, this idea of port mapping is similar to, this is port mapping. We will do that port mapping, but in this example, they're talking about volume mapping. And this volume mapping example is illustrated in this line here. What is going on under the hood is that they are basically mapping a folder. So for example, there is some folder here on the real machine, yet you want to map it to the container inside. That is what is going on here. And you want to make a read-only mapping. That's the read-only RO part. So that's the example. Now let's generalize this. So if you want to do a mapping of a volume, volume basically means, think of it as disk or folder. Folder is more, more accurate. If you want to map a folder, that you have on a real computer and map it to some folder inside a container, that's the method you operate on. So you use the dash V flag, dash V. Let's go see a quick example of this one before we run the more complex Nginx example. So I'll do some dash V mapping very quickly here. So right now we have this uh, existing file called copy a file. You've seen this already. So I will now, what I will do is make a volume mapping. 
and <clears throat> what I want to do is map this folder called docker test this folder I want to map it inside inside the runtime container what does that do for us let's go see that so I will have a volume mapping created and I will run this image that we have generated right we have this cloud genius a file image already available so I will use that image I will clean my screen right now and say docker images docker images and I have these images available I want to run this image and I want to run it in interactive form so something like this docker run dash it and then cloud genius slash a file and then give me a bash prompt in there that's what I see I see that this a file exists there and that is nice however I would like to now implement the idea of a volume mapping so I come out of it and then write my command slightly differently what did I write before was this and now what I will do is write it slightly differently how will I want to write it the idea that I want to use is volume mapping so I will create a new file as a placeholder file new and then use this as a place to hold the command I want to write and I will insert the dash v flags and in there I will specify I want to map my folder which is the one I want to use which is home user and docker test I want to map this folder over to a folder inside inside the runtime container where this file sits and I can choose a name I would like so I'll maybe choose a name like like Nilesh for example so if I use this mapping and I run the command with this flag number four in the command itself basically expand this command to go like this so I'll say volume mapping include that segment in my run command like this so I expanded the scope of my command to include a volume mapping that maps my docker test folder with a folder called Nilesh inside inside the container when I run it and I run it like this what is going to happen let's go find out I think my syntax is correct but let's go check so that's what I'm running here in the terminal I will type docker run dash v with a volume mapping dash home user docker test this name actually maps to this folder and then I'm mapping it in a dash v volume mapping to a folder inside called Nilesh and then I get an interactive prompt bash prompt in the image that I created so when I list out I see that there is a folder called Nilesh that shows up and if I go in that folder called Nilesh I should see exactly what I have in my docker test because it is a volume mapping it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between this folder here and the Nilesh folder inside the container now what this idea you will expect to see when I list when I list this you will see the docker file and the a file right just like you see these guys I will create another file here called uh, touch uh, B file and when I do that a new file pops up in my right side here B file right there if I create touch C that C file shows up and this is I am operating in the container and I can see that these files are getting created I can remove my a file and you will see that the, the editor window on the left side the a file disappears and I can remove my B file and B file disappears and I can remove my C file and C also goes away and I can create a bunch of uh, uh, files like touch a B C D E F and so I have these six files created and so what you see from here is a volume mapping it's a one-on-one -on -one association between a folder outside and a folder inside your container that you ran but you made sure to pass this argument now 
what does that argument do? Let's go understand it. So I'm going to change my illustrations. Uh, so changing my screen sharing again. And I will draw the picture as to what I just said, which is the dash V option. That is kind of interesting option from a, from a perspective of uh, volume mapping. So what we just did is in our, in our machine, we had a folder that goes by the name uh, tilde uh, doc uh, test. That was the name. And what I did was to make sure that I map this folder to slash nilesh. I was able to create that mapping by creating a volume flag dash V. And then this can also be written as slash home slash user slash Docker test. So I use that fully expanded form in my argument along with dash V followed by this followed by the destination, the colon, there is a colon here, by the way. So I should write it properly, colon slash Nilesh. That's the syntax as you saw in the example before. And so what this does essentially is this idea, which is break the layered file system, break it, go straight to the root, to the bottom layer of the actual machine. So whatever layers that we had in the past in this layered file system structure, you saw us discuss these things here, right? Up, up here, we discussed layers uh, all the way to the top, I think. Yeah, we discussed these layers here. So <coughs> what I am suggesting in here is when you put a dash, dash V option, it breaks all these things like that and goes straight to the foundation layer where the operating system is, the real machine is and makes a mapping. So you can basically use the dash V option to bypass the layers. That's the idea, dash V. And so this is a good way to actually pass items to a container. So if you have like a container here, and another container here, another container here, and you have some bunch of files sitting in your main machine. This machine runs an operating system. You have a bunch of files here sitting for A, and these files are meant for your container C. So you could do a volume mapping, say, you know what, you, you need those files sitting here. I can do a dash V option mapping, dash V, and say, you know what, map this folder here, to those files sitting in that folder. And you are C and you are B. You don't need any mapping, so B gets no mapping. But C needs this mapping of file C, so I can do a dash V option and map all the files it needs from this location. And when I go do these kind of dash V mappings, I am basically bypassing the layer file system. And by bypassing that, I'm able to access directly straight to the machine itself, the actual real computer. And I can get these containers to access certain files. And I can mark them read write or read only, depending on whatever I choose. I have the option to put, you know, suffix something like this dash V, some file or some folder, uh, colon, some other folder, colon, read only. I could specify like that. Read only will be a read only. It will allow container to read only. No changes happen here, actual, no actual changes. It cannot make changes if you specify read only. If you don't specify anything, it is read write. In the list? Yes. If, um, okay, so a container has some of a file system, a layered file system, that's only accessible to that container. Correct. So if you were like running a calculation that had intermediate results, mm -hmm. 
then you could store those intermediate results in the container, and if the container died, that's okay. You don't need those results. And then it, when you completed the calculation and had got your answer, you could write that final answer back to this mapped uh, directory to save it. Correct. That's the usage case. It's a very good use case you described. If you have some interim data, you don't store it outside. You just put it in the container. But when you get a final result you want to preserve for a longer duration or a subsequent output, you put it outside the container. And the better off you are if you don't store stuff in your container. Because containers go and come and die and they come again and things like that. So you want to keep these containers with as little data as you can get away with and store stuff outside. So this was an example of storing stuff outside where we are storing the sum folder is the actual location and this is your container representation, some other folder. And uh, that's the dash V option. So that we'll do another, another exercise, by the way. That, that exercise is what I want to do next. So switching my screens again. And while you're doing that, this external file system could actually be a network file share. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It can be anything. It, so it doesn't have to be on the real machine. It can be anything outside. Totally. You can map whatever. Whatever you can access from the real machine, you can put as a volume mapping. It could be a FS tab entry if you if you know what FS tab is. Anything that goes in here, slash etc slash FS tab, anything that you can put here, you can do a volume mapping. So a disk, external disk, network disk, SAN, NAS, what you bring whatever storage you like, put it there, it will map. Great. Sweet. Okay. So changing my screen display again. Uh, I would like to seek some feedback about this display changing business in my notepad today versus my notepad yesterday. As you may notice, I am using a different computer this time. This one, it's my Surface. I'm playing with it. If you don't like this experience, please tell me that it sucks so I can throw away this machine. If you find that this is better an improvement of what I did before, please tell me that also. So I can, you know, if you don't like this today's experience of me writing on this, this surface, then please tell me you don't like it. So I can always go back to my old way of doing things, which is still there. I don't see any change. You don't see any change? Okay. <laughs> okay. I just wasted $2,700. <laughs> <But it's okay. laughs> if you don't see any change, then what's the point? Why did I waste money? <laughs> but <laughs> that's just me being me. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a valid point. If you don't see any change, why do I waste money? I guess, but whatever. So stopping share from here, going to the other machine and let's see. <clears throat> so I am talking about that volume mapping, right? So this, this Nginx thing tells us to do a volume mapping. That's what we started discussing. So we go back here to our discussion and it says Docker run. And you have a share. Oh, sorry. Thank you for thank you for reminding me. So in this case, we did notice a difference. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Good one. And so uh, this <laughs> actually uh, that that actually tells me something useful, which is that this switching over actually can lead to me forgetting. And so that's the reason. That's one reason I can say that switching over is actually bad because it can lead to forgetfulness. But I still have no, no inclination to throw this machine away. So I'll probably keep it, but I'll probably go back to this black uh, vacuum thing. So I'll, I'll next time, next time. So right now uh, we are discussing this, right? So this some random name is more of a cosmetic thing. So I will delete that. You know, we're not doing it. Now, uh, this volume mapping I just briefly discussed, right? So let us put something interesting here. For example, home user slash docker test and then in there i would like to place a file called index html file by the way and then run this this volume mapping like we described so that's my plan is to run this command and if i run this command this folder here will get mapped over to the nginx folder where it expects to have html content 
Nginx as an application expects to have its content. Why is it shaking around? Okay, okay. The Nginx has this location specified by default. That is the location where it expects to see HTML content and whatever is there will show up on the front page of your website whenever you open port number 80. That's the idea. So now we will have to have something in here that is representative of index HTML. So we will first of all copy this whole thing, go to our Linux workstation, and there put this command in place like this, and now create an index HTML in this folder. Right now I have this uh, ABCD, so I'll remove A, B, C, A, A, B, C, D, E, F, I'll remove all of them, and then create uh, index HTML file touch index HTML I created that file right now I will come out of this container this container was the cloud genius uh, a file container so that's a dummy example we'll, we'll discard it now we'll use the nginx example this time we have this index HTML that says hello cloud genius that's all it says simple file and it is permission denied because it was created by root so I have to go and modify the permissions. I cannot write on my own file. But as you can see, this permission was created by root. Docker processes run in root mode. So I am not root. So I have to go modify that permission before I can save this content. So what I will do is change the permissions of the ownership of the file. Sudo chon uh, cloud genie, uh, sorry, user, user colon user and index HTML. And now it asked me for the password. So I gave it the password and now I have my control back. Now I can save this file. So it saves and close. Now I want to run this command. What does this command do? It maps that particular folder, which is the Docker test folder containing one file called index HTML, which is the important file. This Docker file is kind of redundant. Now we are not doing that particular exercise. I should get rid of it. So it's gone. Only thing we have in this folder is index HTML. That looks like this. And now I want to run the nginx container. In that container, I want to do a volume mapping. The volume mapping goes like line number two. Like this, line number two. And all of this is just one command. The dash D option, line number three, stands for run like a demon. And so we will run it like a demon. So I'll copy this whole thing and run the nginx image as a container with the volume mapping in place and you will see that it runs and it is running and there we have it bunch of things running most of them dead one of them is actually actually active docker ps should show you one thing which is the nginx thing right let's go see what it shows us and so you will you will, let's go carefully examine first the docker ps so here we have docker ps so what do we see? We see that it is this container ID running Nginx like a daemon. It is up and running. It did not die because I ran it like a daemon and I ran it like this command, which has a volume mapping in its place and a daemon mode and Nginx process running. It also shows me that port number 80 is open, but it is the container port. I cannot get to it. I cannot open this, this website that shows me my index file. I, I cannot get there and that's the problem. So I have to overcome that problem. I, I, I'll attempt to go localhost, by the way, localhost colon port number 80 and you will find that there is nothing in there. Unable to connect, expected because this thing is running inside a container this container id it doesn't actually expose anything you can go and see that container from inside by connecting to it and you will find that it has this volume mapping in its place and all that good stuff however it will not show us anything here unable to connect so for that to work correctly i would need to modify my properties my command to run this should include a port mapping as well. That port mapping should come from 
this section. Something like this. That line number three has to be added in order for the port number 80 inside the container to become visible to the machine outside. That mapping has to be created. And so we'll do that. But before I do that, I like to clean up some things. Uh, so docker rm minus f, uh, docker ps, ps dash aq, what am I typing? Docker ps dash aq, clean up. And now docker ps should show nothing. Good. Now I will run that, uh, <coughs> that command one more time, by the way. This one, without port mapping. So it is running, you see that the the site is still not accessible localhost port number 80 should show us nothing which is expected localhost port number 80 should show us nothing and there is nothing okay now i will make sure that i check the docker uh, ps again and you will see that this doesn't have a, hold on, hold on, what am I typing? Docker PS. You will see that this has a port open at the container level, but it is still not connected to the real machine, for which we have to run the command slightly differently. It should include this line number three, and we will now run this way. First of all, break the other way. So I want to kill this container that is running right now. So I'll say Docker you die uh, docker you die is written like this docker rm minus f f e zero that's how i think it is written so it kills itself now having killed that one i will like to run the same container with a port mapping like this and a volume mapping like this and then i execute so it runs it shows me a docker ps and this time you will see that the port mapping is clearly visible. You can see that this port mapping was limited to only the container. This time it shows port mapping from anywhere on the internet, 0000, 0, 0, 0 colon 80, maps to the container port 80. And it is up and running for the last four seconds. It is running Nginx daemon and it is the container ID here. So now I should be able to go to my browser and open the localhost port number 80 and say refresh and I should say, there we go. So we saw it. We saw it shows us our index HTML file showed up right there. It showed up because the content here says that. If I say, hello, uh, Hello, everyone, and save. I'm saving it on my real computer, by the way. Just remember, this is my real machine. And I save it on my real machine. And I close the file. And I go to the web browser. In the browser, I refresh. And you see, hello, everyone popped up. This popped up because my file changed on the real machine. <coughs> <coughs> Which means the container picked up the changes. Why did it pick up the changes? Because of line number two. Container picked up the changes in this location, read only mode, and the actual content is sitting in line number two in this location, which is this index HTML file. Hello everyone. I'll make it something else, like hello everybody. And save and maybe with an exclamation mark and save and close this window now that change again happened so you can see that if i refresh hello everybody comes up but the point is that we are able to modify whatever we want in this location map it to a container inside and have the nginx process that is running read that portion in read only mode and this Nginx image is responsible for showing whatever you have in this location in the container in the port number 80 at the container level, which is mapped to the port number 80 at the machine level. And therefore, we are able to see it here. Now, we can extend this idea and actually take this thing out all the way to the internet. 
this is a virtual machine. So it is limited to that VM, but we can extend it, take it outside to my, my LAN in, in the local area network I am in, and then take another NAT route and put it out on the public internet. I can do that. But all of these are academic exercises. We can, you know, we can keep doing these things. But the concept that I want to drive today is port mapping is how you map ports, like line number three. And volume mapping is how you map folders. You bypass the layer file system, go straight to the machine like this. And those examples illustrate that point. Here is the port mapping represented. Now let's go back to the image. And in that image, it is telling us you can do it two ways. So the one way is running like a volume mapping. But however, in this example, they don't talk about the port mapping part that was missing. They don't describe it. It is not uh, written with all the details possible, but whatever. The other way of doing the same thing is that you could create whatever you have in form of a Docker file. What does that mean? It means you could write the same command in form of a Docker file. So for example, I'll create a new file and create a Docker file basically. So I will like to save this as my Docker file. And in that Docker file, I would like to begin from Nginx. And then I would like to copy. What do I want to copy? I want to copy my index HTML. And I'll copy it over to that location, which is that location where Nginx expects it to be, like this location. So I'm copying this file and placing it inside the container like this. And when I have this image constructed, I will have a method of running a site containing my index HTML file inside the container without having to do a volume mapping because I'm actually copying my files over. So this image that I am running here, I want to kill it. So I'll say docker rm minus f to d go away in docker ps dash a i have nothing so it's clean and now i want to build a new image the new image i want to build is <clears throat> uh, that will contain this index html inside the image already so no need of volume mapping and so i will build that image pretty much like this docker build and then give it a tag and call it Cloud Genius and reuse the name from the last time. I'll just overwrite the name. I have this name called a file. I'll just reuse that image name, the tag, and then build. When I build, it builds. What did it build? Let's go read. It says from Nginx. So the foundation is Nginx. That's the good starting point, which actually gives us not just an operating system, but also, also, a application server already installed from this this group called nginx nginx by the way is a uh, open source product nginx is this product it is open source high performing blah 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 web server you can read more about it i like it it's a very good server and that's what we are using it is open source and available from here that's our foundation now having understood the foundation piece uh, that's what it did is use that as a foundation as the beginning point and then copy index HTML from the source location, which is what the folder is that location, wherever you are, the dot location is dot. And then copy it over to this location inside the image that I'm creating. So it goes inside the image and then it builds that image. The image is built. It's called five Charlie echo echo and I will check it out, Docker images. So I see that my, my file Charlie Echo Echo is this image, not this one. That's not the, the one, that's the 59 minutes ago image. So I want to get rid of it. 
So I will say, you know, Docker images, Docker RMI, you get rid of that image. I don't want it anymore. And so Docker images shows me the things that I want. I have Nginx already, which I copied from the cloud. I have this, this new image I created and I created it one minute ago. That image is basically built from this Docker file, which copies my index HTML over to the container image, which is now has this name called a file. I can push it, Docker push. And it will override the existing image name and it will basically delete the old one, put this one on top. And I will have a new image available for you with the same name. So I'm just reusing the same name. I don't have to, but I did. So I have that image pushed to you. You can also do the same thing as I do it. And what I will do is I want to run that image. How do I run it? Docker. And I want to run it. And how do I run it? Uh, like a daemon. And what do I run? Cloud Genius A file. And let it run. So when it runs, it runs. It's running like a daemon, like dash D. So I'm not getting an interactive teletype writer like a bash prompt to interact with, but I could connect to it anytime I want to. And that's a new idea here to connect to a running image. So I have this image running, Docker PS that is running. I want to connect to it. So I'll say Docker exec. And I want to connect and give me an interactive teletype writer prompt on that container that is running right now. Oops, cancel, zoom. And so I want to connect to that container. So allow me to connect, not this, not this. Allow me to connect to A25 and give me a bash prompt. This A25 comes from this number here, container ID. Allow me to execute a bash prompt inside that container, which is running already. Don't create a new one, just connect to this. So I get connected. Now I am inside, inside that running container. I can go to user share, nginx, and find out what do I have. I have HTML file. In that HTML folder, what do I have? I have this index HTML. Let's go cat it. And I see that it says, hello, everybody. So I'm running this and it has port number 80 open at the container level. So if I want to access it from the outside, it will not be visible. I cannot see it because I did not run the dash P option. So if I here say localhost and try to access, it says unable to connect, which is expected. Going back here, I will come out of the container and delete the container and run it again with a dash P option. So the container I ran was Docker RM, what was the number again? The number was this command A25. So I'll kill it, A25, I killed. Now we'll run the command again to execute a new container with the daemon option, dash D option, and also the dash P option with port number mapping 80 to the real machine port number 80 and run. So it runs. I can check Docker PS dash A. And I can see that it is running up and running for three seconds and the ports are correctly mapped. Machine, machine port 80 mapping to container port 80. And that means I can open the website. So I refresh and I see hello everybody. Now this, hello everybody is coming straight from the container. If I change it in this file now, change it to whatever I like and I save, this change doesn't automatically propagate to the container because it is not connected. It is copied over. This is a copy command. And the Docker file I used created a copy. Uh, so uh, this, this is actually a replica of the file that originally existed. Now this says some random character, but this did not change as a consequence. You will still that it is still localhost shows everybody. That is totally according to how we expect because it's a copy operation in the Docker file, not a volume mapping. So this container that is running 24 brother, this one is running with the copy of the index HTML that existed at the time of building. Whenever the container image was built, at that time, whatever the index HTML value was, is what will show up. Even if you change whatever you have on your real computer, it doesn't matter. You can even delete it. So like the RM index HTML, it's gone. And you still have 
hello everybody there. It doesn't change. It should not change because it's a copy. And that's uh, your uh, building images and uh, running it in the context of a uh, container. So I will not save this one. And you saw the dash V option, the dash P option. Let's explore some more. And uh, something I would like to actually uh, describe this idea is watch this. Watch this uh, when, I, when I do it. So let's go see here, Docker PS dash A. You have this one thing running, right? This one, 24 brother. So I would like to kill it, Docker RM, and then say, kill it. So it kills. No, it did not kill. RM minus F. Okay, now it kills. Docker PS, and there's nothing now. Now, if I want to start a new container, I can very easily do it like, uh, like this and mark the amount of time it takes to start an operation. Just watch how much time it takes, right? Start your clock when I hit enter. So I will hit enter by the way, at three, two, one, and go. It took a fraction of a second, uh, even less than that, to start and instantiate a container, issue a container ID, and that container ID is up and running in a matter of sub-second. Sub, a couple milliseconds actually. It takes a few milliseconds to instantiate a complete container running a complete application on a virtual machine. This is a VM by the way. It is even faster on a real computer. It's very quick. It is quick to start, quick to stop, quick to delete, quick to destroy, you know, quick to recreate. That is what you're looking at from a container instantiation perspective. Now compare this time it takes to start a machine with time it takes to start a VM. You go here to some cloud and not, not this timer, but say go to AWS or go to Amazon or go to Google or any of these cloud companies, right? You sign into their consoles, go to Azure, for example, all of these guys, they are basically the same thing. They take a lot of time. They waste a lot of time in starting a machine, starting a full-fledged virtual machine. And that is a fact of life. In fact, the best, quickest start promise is from this company. They claim that they will give you a machine in 55 seconds or less. Let's go see the promise, see what the promise is. Uh, where is the front page? Digital Ocean. I think the front, front page says the promise is, yeah, there's the promise right there. Deploy in seconds. Spin a droplet and get root access to it in 55 seconds, right? That's the promise right there. And they're bragging about it, by the way. <laughs> 55 seconds is a brag. I would show them this. Okay. Kill a, kill a, create a container. Uh, like, first of all, kill this one. So say, for example, RM minus F, zero E. So it goes away. And then I start a new container and show them this. Boom. I have it in a, in a matter of sub seconds. You claim 55 seconds. That's the minimum amount of time in a real cloud that takes to start a machine. It's by the way, a very high performing uh, virtual machine solution. No doubt about it. It is impressive to do a VM in 55 seconds. Most other cloud companies take a long time, like two minutes, sometimes Azure takes 10 minutes. And that's the nature of the beast. It is bad from a startup performance perspective. But that's what we have. VMs are VMs. They are slow, they're fat, they're big. And they have their own benefits in terms of that they can run whatever operating system you like. But so is true with containers as long as you are using the same underlying kernel. We saw in the example I showed you earlier, which is as long as you have the same kernel under the hood, which is Linux, you can run any flavor of Linux, you know, CentOS or Ubuntu or Debian or God knows what. As long as it uses Linux kernel, you can run it in a container and start it in sub-second time. And you can start hundreds of them 
or even more depending on how much capacity you have in your real computer start lots and lots of them in a matter of minute matter of sub seconds not minutes sub seconds and that is the idea that i will like talk 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 about next the next topic which uh, is uh, i think sandeep suggested that we discuss and so i'm going to read sandeep's question and read it out for you and sandeep said during our next class can you please discuss serverless computing it sounds like a step above platform as a service to me but i don't really understand it yet so that is what i will now discuss briefly and we'll do more examples later on but i think uh, sandeep has this point which is you know think about this idea now i will switch my screens again and describe in a written form in our notepad so switching it again go to my notepad and opening up a sheet of paper <clears throat> so a virtual machine startup time vm takes 55 seconds in a container setup which is running on top of a vm by the way in this example i am showing you it takes sub seconds sub second startup and in in bigger machines and real machines it is even faster so the idea of execution of something you want to run uh, when i say something i should actually specify some piece of code you want to run some piece of code piece of code it can be a full fledged application or just a tiny little piece of code depending on whatever you want to run you can run this piece inside a virtual machine which will take 55 seconds to start up and then you will eventually see the machine coming up and online and your application starts to function and all that good stuff will happen and you are happy about it however if you take this idea <coughs> and apply this to a container situation you are able to start and stop a container at a sub second response what does that translate to it allows us to break our big application into smaller pieces and start ultimately you know divide the work that we have in a big application into smaller pieces the so people talk about this idea in a variety of shapes and topics people talk about this idea as uh, what is called uh, service oriented architecture people use the word uh, sometimes people use the word uh, do one thing and do it well by the way this is a unix philosophy do one thing do it really well if you are able to break down your big application into small parts that do one thing you are able to then create isolated interdependent components that do one thing and do it really well as opposed to a spaghetti or a conglomeration or a big mix of a big gigantic application that, that you may have seen or you probably probably you already run them many many cases so what i'm suggesting is this idea of breaking down your big applications into small chunks small independent chunks that can be run on run on their own and are dependent among other chunks of code so simple pieces of code that are individual by itself and assign one team one team to focus on developing that particular piece of code that one particular thing and this is going to be another team and when you are doing this kind of a structure of breaking down your bigger problem that a bigger application that you're building you break that down into smaller digestible small chunks that do one thing do it really well uh, there is a acronym for this doughty da something like that i i don't, I don't remember do one thing do it do one thing do it well something like that there is an acronym for that look it up acronym 
And so you should look at, look this thing up. The, the core idea I'm describing is you break your bigger application into smaller chunks that run by itself all alone and interact with other pieces of your code in form of a transaction. So some kind of a dependency that you might have and focus your team structure in form of what I call two pizza teams. Something of a size of say six to seven people, not more than that, that can have lunch in two pizzas. That's the optimal structure that is encouraged at companies like Amazon, for example. They will encourage team sizes of two pizza teams. In fact, they take pride of uh, this idea of putting a two pizza team on one piece of code that will build something functional in itself and do that one thing really well. And our idea that we are discussing primarily back to the discussion around containers is that you want to run these segments of your code that are independent, standalone, and make interdependent, inter interdependencies among other pieces of your code to build out your comprehensive service that you want to create and run each such segment of that code in a container. When you do that kind of a setup, that is the model which is tremendously popular these days. That's how people are rewriting their applications, containerizing their applications, and extending this concept to a unit, of, a, a unit of code that is basically self-contained. And I'll give you more examples as we go along. And run each of these in form of individual containers. Uh, create, create container images for them, maintain those images, and manage, the team will manage that particular image and construct things together and put your entire service together in form of a containerized architecture for your application. Now, this idea that I just described, your big monolithic application, that you break that down into simpler modules that are independent, stand alone, that do one thing and do it well, do one thing, do it well kind of model. Uh, th this, this mode of operation is suited for containerization. And this takes time to start, time to set up, time to do everything is long time. Whereas if you do simpler modules, you are able to start and stop services very efficiently because you are not only breaking that problem into a simple example or simple constructs of your bigger picture and then running them in the context of containers, which allows you agility. And quick start, quick stops if you like moving around stuff, if you like, from this location to that location, this cloud to that cloud, that is possible. However, having said that, if you take this same idea and further break down your simple concepts of code or pieces of code to even a single transaction, so you want to run something simply one thing like one query for example or one operation one execution of some concept if you take that the idea of serverless computing essentially is somewhat conceptually similar to what you saw uh, we saw this uh, uh, static sites without servers right you, you you have done those examples without servers you were able to create a site with a bucket and item in there and you created a site, static site without a server. So this is a static site though. Now here we, in context of serverless computing is the same idea of containerization extended and pushing it to its limits. What is that limit? The limit is to run one single transaction in one container instantiation. They don't use the word container there because they don't want you to believe that this is actually a, a system on the back end. They want to use magical words. Magical, like serverless. Yeah, yeah, I know. There is server on the back end, everybody knows, but they want to make it look magical. That's why their branding is serverless, but essentially there are servers on the back, somebody's managing. And so if you see these things, they are implemented across multiple clouds. For example, Amazon will use the word Lambda. 
Google will use function. And Microsoft also has a similar thing called function. And so these names that they're made up, they're, they sound magical, they sound serverless, but essentially they are going to run a single transaction at a time. This is pushing your limits of running containers. They start very quickly, they finish off their work very quickly, and they're able to be, they're able to process your transactions. So from a serverless standpoint, what happens if you look at, say for example, uh, let's go to some serverless examples here. Uh, Google Functions is one. Let's see what they do. So I'm typing Google Functions. Google Functions uh, is, uh, uh, is a serverless solution. So Google Functions is this one. Cloud Functions, that's the name they use, Cloud Functions. We'll go there and view the documentation. It's very simple. The idea is that you want to, by the way, this is alpha beta code, so it's not fully released. It's a beta release of Google Cloud Functions. So the idea is that you, that you create a simple function, as simple as a single piece of code in, say, in JavaScript. And you write this function. It is a single function that you're writing in this example. And what this function does is it's a hello world function. And it says, write on the log console, my cloud function, that's the comment you write, and then you exit. That's the function. It's a very simple function to just call something and it will write my cloud function on the console log and be done with it. That's a very, very tiny piece of code. And you will put this code in a bucket. And then ask this function to be executed. When the function gets executed, you don't have to have a server created. You don't even have to manage Docker. All you do is to use the serverless concept. What does that actually do at the backside? They will instantiate a container just for this one particular function call, this call, and then invoke it, do whatever the function says, which is to print this line item in the log and be done with it. And then they will extinguish the container and you're basically charged for only the time of execution. They put certain financial limits, they put certain time limits as to how long the function can run, say for example, 30 seconds or something like that. They'll put some time boundaries as to how long can you have a function running. And so if you break down your bigger problem into smaller chunks of code that can actually interact with a cloud service on the back end where you don't have to manage not even Docker containers, not even any machine. So. So would it be fair to say that serverless computing is basically containers as a service? You could, but then if you use the word container as a service, uh -huh. then you expect to receive containers, but you don't. Here, in this example, you don't receive a container. So if you say platform as a service, you expect to receive platform. If you say right, right, infrastructure right, right. as a service, you expect to receive infrastructure. If you say container as a service, you expect to receive containers. But here, you don't receive a container. All you do is you receive a place to execute your code. That's it. Okay, so what you're really getting is a place to execute your code. Okay, makes Correct. sense. Okay. And that is why the idea of the branding, the name serverless comes from, you know, they're basically telling you, you don't worry about containers, we'll handle it for you, man. Don't worry, we'll do it. So when you're consuming these services, do you have to specify the, the type of code that you need to write? Like what if I wanted to write a PHP? Correct, uh, correct. Word, example. Yes, you do, yes, you specify that. So let's go see another example. So here we go to um, Google, sorry, Amazon Cloud. We'll see their serverless thing. Let's see, what is my password? Oh man, I'd never remember the password. I, I, I'm sorry, let's, let's uh, go to Microsoft, see if they have it. So, or rather AWS, uh, Lambda, there we go. 
awesome. That's a quick search. And so here, let's see, product details. This is Amazon serverless, right? So if you go and read about what does this do? So you have to specify the language of choice. In Amazon's solution set, I think they support three languages, if I remember right. Maybe they have added more. But they support JavaScript, they support Python, and they support Java. It tells you right here, AWS Lambda supports Java, Node.js, which is JavaScript, C Sharp, which is a new thing I did not know, and Python. So these, these languages are supported. So they, they just added C-sharp apparently. And uh, so what will happen is your <coughs> um, code that you have, you have to write in one of these four codes, four, four languages, right? These guys, Node.js, Java, C-sharp, and Python. Four languages, four methods of operation. You write your functions. You write as tiny function as you can get away with that is still meaningful. And then you write that, save that code and put that in a bucket and then execute the invoke that code the invocation happens on an event i'll tell you what an event will mean in the context of what we are discussing just stand by so the execution will happen in the context of an event and when the execution happens this code that you have placed in a bucket will get executed now where does it get execute it goes to this serverless infrastructure which by the way is absolutely not serverless there are a bunch of servers there and a bunch of servers running mostly containers and they will they will manage the containers they will manage the servers so from your perspective it is serverless because you're not managing it from your perspective it is dockerless it is containerless it is serverless because you're not doing any of these things all you're doing is writing your code putting it in a bucket and invoking it somehow. Now, when you invoke, that piece of code actually gets to start a container for a very small, small specific purpose, immediately pushing the boundary all the way as narrow as you can get to, which is to run your just one that segment of code, that one time operation. It will finish it off. It will charge you money for the transaction of the activity that you just did and then be done with it, relinquish the resources and move on. And put your result back in your bucket, by the way. Put the result of your computation, you have to write code in a fashion that you put the result back in your bucket or some other place. And then you don't have to worry about executing any machine, any VM, any container. You don't have to worry about any kind of server infrastructure at all whatsoever and that is serverless you got that yeah thank you cool now uh, uh we uh, by the way this, this thing is evolving it is still uh, fresh and you will see some of these things there are some exercises uh, that we can put uh, maybe in the third segment uh, for, for serverless computing but i think this is the 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 uh, boundary condition of pushing containers all the way to the limit of running just one thing and the pricing is crazy if you read the pricing details you'll say you know one million requests per month are free nice next after that every time you invoke some code 20 cent per one million and the duration is calculated from the time your code begins to execute until it returns the value or otherwise terminates itself rounded up to the nearest 100 milliseconds so that's the minimum amount of time time chunk a chunk of time is 100 milliseconds the price depends on the amount of memory you allocate so you are charged some tiny tiny number for every gigabyte second this is a unit right you notice the unit the unit of measurement is gb second so it's the gigabyte and seconds of usage of your gigabytes. How many gigabytes and how many seconds do you consume? You're based on that. They will charge you 00001667 for every gigabyte second of consumption with a minimum charge rounded up to 100 milliseconds. 
and you might consume like half a half a GB or maybe less. So if your processes are efficient, they don't consume too much memory, you are better off. If your processes are expensive, they, they need lots of memory, they will charge you by the gigabyte as well of RAM. This is RAM allocation. So that's the kind of pricing structure. And this is Amazon's pricing. You, you look at pricing from Google, from Microsoft, they have similar structure in pricing. So you can see Azure Functions, Azure Functions, that they call it what? Functions, I think, Functions, yeah. Same, uh, same kind of name here, Azure Functions, serverless architecture, and uh, they will talk about uh, uh, same ideas again, but different languages maybe. Where is the language set? Uh, okay, pricing, pricing options, function pricing, pay by the minute, per minute billing, pricing calculator. Yeah, this being Microsoft, they just have to be difficult in finding what the answer is. <laughs> they don't show you pricing in simple English. They make me run pricing calculator. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can run, you know, if, you, if you're interested in pricing, you can always discuss these things. You can run through this pricing calculator and find out, but yeah, I don't think you are interested. You can add an item and yeah. Yeah, you, you can run through the machine, this, this tool yourself to figure it out if you're interested in pricing. But the idea is you take your piece of code in the language that they support, of three or four languages supported, and you run it, you execute. You don't have to worry about server. And remember, like you said, this is not container as a service because what is container as a service? Let me describe that to you. A container as a service is this, one example. This is a container as a service solution where Amazon is giving you containers. Another solution, by the way, we, I, I personally don't use this method because this is just uh, clumsy. I prefer using directly like this Docker directly, and uh, you will you will see why. I also prefer uh, Kubernetes. You will see that because they are open source. That's what I like, and I don't want to lock myself with one particular cloud. So I use this thing, which I like, Kubernetes. You will see examples of these and exercises, and uh, also another implementation of the same idea from the Docker company which is also open source called Docker Swarm. And we will have some exercises for this as well. So these guys are orchestration tools, like Swarm Mode is one, Kubernetes is another. And uh, these are, you know, we will build on the concepts. We have, right now we are just discussing Docker at the very basic level, like, you know, volume mapping, port mapping, understanding uh, building images, understanding Docker file, understanding layered file system, isolation, the concepts and wrapping our head around that core set of technologies. And we'll take these concepts and build something useful. We'll, uh, we'll uh, do, 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 do those things as we go along. Right now, I think we have, how much time we have? Like 20 minutes left. So what I want to do is uh, uh, take a minute to pause here, ask questions. And today is the last day for cloud technologies. I want to make sure that I help you understand what that means. It means there are certain changes that are happening. One of the changes that, that will happen is that uh, some of you might lose access to the bootcamp cloud technology segment. If you're not registered, you might get disconnected from your content that you see here. And by the way, I have made sure to extend the access. So you, it's not rushed to you, but you, if you need more time, you just chat with me. I know two of you are not continuing right away. You might come back later. So you might see that your access might get disconnected. If it so happens, I have, by the way, made sure it doesn't go right away. So it, I have extended the time already, but if it does by mistake so happen that you get lost in your access, please tell me, I will extend it. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is that this, uh, Zoom conference number that we have been using, this number that we have, which is whatever that number that you just signed on with Zoom, that number will change. And I will email you that new number for the next set of sections, which is cloud technology, the DevOps segment, which starts uh, next time. The next time we start on what date? Uh, we start on is uh, Friday. So Friday at uh, four, four o'clock, 
Pacific time is when we will start DevOps segment on May 5th. And that time, this ID number for Zoom conference will change. The third change that will happen is that this Slack chat channel might kick you out if you're not in the bootcamp anymore. That group team chat, will you, you might get kicked out of there, but no worries, you have one-on-one -on -one chat always going all the time. That doesn't go away. You have a one-on-one -on -one chat method already with any, and you can chat any, any to any. So all of us can chat using the same method, except that this group chat for the April Cloud Bootcamp, that thing will disappear for those who are not continuing anymore. I just want you to point, remember that. And the, the fourth thing, which is this notebook that you have been using, you have this notebook. This notebook access will also get disconnected. What does that mean? You should copy stuff right now. Uh, this technology segment that you have, all these things, you should make a copy of whatever you want to preserve here, make a local copy, and that way you can continue to access this written content that I have in your local OneNote notebook. That I think you should make sure that you do make a, make a local copy. Having said, those are the changes that are happening uh, and coming your way as we, as we proceed our direction, in the, in the next direction. The next thing I want to talk about is this uh, DevOps segment, which starts next time. I would like you to have already read a book. The book is called The Goal, which I think I mentioned a while ago. It is a, a required reading for our program, is this book called The Goal, which I think I mentioned you, if I remember right. Uh, if not, I will remind you again. The book is The Goal. You can go and read that book, uh, at least a summary of that book in the bootcamp here. So if you go to Cloud DevOps segment here in this one, you should be able to find a short summary of the book right here, which I expect you to read already. And the book summary is right here in module number two. Uh, unit number three. That's where a book summary is already provided. You can get this book, the goal book already in your public library. Our public library in King County has a copy of this book and the book should be available to you freely. And you can use a, an app called Overdrive app. Overdrive. That app uh, lets you download the book on your computer. You should be able to read it right here. If not, just go to Amazon and buy the gold book. It is cheap. Last time I saw the price was $2. And I even alerted you to buy it. The gold book should be today. The price is, buy a used, used copy is good. I mean, the used pricing is, how much is it? $3. There we go. So buy it, please. Please buy this book. $3.63. This book is a very good book and it is a reading for the program that we have. This book is not technical. It is more about operations. It's more about thinking about how people operate, how people need to operate. It is a recommended reading by Jeff Bezos. It is a textbook for MBA students. It has nothing whatsoever to do with cloud technologies, but it has everything to do with how to operate properly. And that is the concept I want to drive. Make sure that you read this book. Having said, <coughs> stopping chair from here and listening for questions. So go ahead, please. Any questions for today? Do we need to have finished reading the book before the class or? Uh, 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 good question. So I expect you to have at least finished reading the book summary that you have there on the website, which is like, like not a big summary. It's a short one page. So read the summary at least and read the book. And uh, the book is a, is a good read for life in general. So make sure to read that. It is, I don't expect you to finish, the, but the book is very small. <laughs> it's like 300 pages, reads like a storybook. And uh, it is funny if you listen to the audio book. It's actually funny. I found it funny because it has these various characters and their accents and Israeli accent and you know, American accent and all those accents come in and mix. And it is kind of funny to listen. If you have an audiobook version from the library, take that. Okay, 
uh, with the, the next time what I want to be able to do is start discussing this idea of creating services in collaboration with our teams that construct some product, some service and give it to our customers and use the way of thinking in terms of operating together, in terms of collaborating together, in terms of creating things together. And this change has happened in many companies. You may have seen them. even big companies like Microsoft, they used to have this idea of you know, developers, testers, and PMs. Those three things together have gone away these days. They don't have any structures like this. They, have, they used to have this test people. They fired everybody. All the test people are gone. The developers and the PMs, they are basically put together in form of what is generally known as people who drive a product and make it out available to the end user customer. You will also see things like these happening in, in other companies across the board where people are basically driven towards delivering a service to the customer. And that is the kind of concept behind DevOps. We'll discuss those things as we go along. And that's the, the start of the next day, uh, which is what we will do. What we'll also do is uh, start doing a lot of hands-on exercises. What does that translate to? That is something that I want to point out very, very clearly right now. Many of you have this feeling that you haven't actually completed all the exercises that we did in the cloud technology segment all along the way. And I think that's reasonable. It's a reasonable assessment of yourself. And you, 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 you talk to me, you ask me this question, hey, are we behind? And I will say, yes, you are. But don't worry. What I really worry about, and I'll tell you what I worry about, is you can always catch up on what you missed. You can repeat and rewind and ask me questions. And we'll do it again if you need to on a one-on-one -on -one basis. However, remember, think of this DevOps segment as a new topic, a new concept, a new course, which means I do not want you to fall behind at all in the DevOps segment. It will start like, like crazy in terms of hands-on exercises, too much hands-on and not enough discussion might happen. So if that happens, just pause me, ask me to stop, ask me to explain, and I will do that. But it is an intense program. Some of the largest exercises we have takes me one hour to finish, and I'm doing it at a full speed. It's a lot of things to do to wrap our head around configuration. That's the biggest problem in, in uh, running cloud applications in, for, a, for a real customer. So configuration management is a big pain point. We have attempted to address that quite a bit in depth. So bottom line that I'm saying, do not fall behind in the DevOps segment. That's one key takeaway I want you to remember. Even if you have not covered certain aspects in the cloud technology segment, it is okay. Move on, move ahead. And begin from cloud DevOps as if you are a fresh start in a new program. That's how you should think. If you forgot something to do in the cloud technology segment, no worries. Come back it, come back at it later when you find more time. If you skip something, no worries. Up until now, we have been basically discussing concepts, core sets of technologies of a variety of different types, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and we skipped software as a service. We discussed containerization. We know virtualization already somewhat. And so that's the kind of framework that we have put together for ourselves to understand core sets of technologies. Now comes the time to make use of it. This usage will come through examples that we'll do hands-on. And as you've seen me, I run most of my examples, almost every single example is live, is with a real cloud and, or with a real machine that I'm doing it with you live. Nothing is recorded or pre-recorded. Most of these exercises I do is on the fly. And while doing these things, I have also made sure to write them down in our DevOps segment. If you see the DevOps segment, there are a ton of exercises after exercises, after exercises goes on using Chef and some using Ansible and some using Docker that we have not yet written down, but we will do them even though they are not written down because the written, writing down part will happen eventually. I have not yet had the dev, Docker portions written down in a fashion that I have for other segments. So don't rely on the written steps exactly as they are written down because we will cover other topics. But one more time, do not fall behind on the DevOps segment. It will hurt, honestly.
it will hurt really bad if you fall behind on the DevOps segment because it, it can become too difficult to catch up. I hope you got that point across. So start a reset, begin with DevOps and begin and keep up to speed like I am doing. I know some of you are busy with other things. It will be in your best interest to keep up to speed with what I am covering. Make sure that you do those things on your own. And if you get stuck, chat with me, call me one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Nilesh. It was a very nice class. I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, Kalaiwani. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, let's uh, let's uh, discard. I think we are discarding a little bit early today. We have still eight minutes, uh, but I would like to uh, pa you know pause recording and wait for any questions if you have. I don't want to you know uh, start a new topic and leave it halfway through. So I will, I will you know begin again on uh, the oh, the day is May five I think yeah. So May five Friday at four o'clock Pacific time, six o'clock central time, seven o'clock Eastern time. We'll see again and I will send out a message with a new number for the Zoom conference. The meeting number will change because the course changes and that number will come out to you in an email. Look for it and sign on using that new number that will start on Friday, 4 p.m. And I'll see you guys at that time. And I'm here for Slack chat and I am pausing recording right now. <laughs>